meeting is being recorded. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, welcome and thank you for joining us for the executive committee meeting of the New York City Health and Hospitals Board Directors. Me, uh, Board Directors. Today's meeting is officially called to order. So, for the record, please note Erin Kelly is representing Deputy Mayor Ann Williams Isom, and Karen St. Hilaire is representing Molly Wasso Park, both in a voting capacity. According to Section 14 of the Bylaws, Committee Attendance, if any member of a standing committee or special committee of the board will not be present at a scheduled committee meeting, the member may ask the chair of the board to request that another board member, not a member of that committee, attends a scheduled meeting and be counted as a member for, for purposes of quorum and voting. So for the record, Vincent Calamia delegated Sally Hernandez Pinheiro, uh, Frida Juan delegated Barbara Lowe, Fenioski Peña Mora delegated Jackie Rowe Adams, and Dr. Ashwin Vasan delegated Deepa Abula, Abula, who is represented by Dr. William Fisher, uh, to be counted as members uh, for the purpose of quorum and voting for this mini So thank you so much. Uh, so let me then go on to the uh, adoption of the minutes for the board meeting held April 27, 2023. Are there any questions, comments, or suggested changes? Uh, can I hear a motion to accept the minutes? So let me ask for your vote uh, one by one, Dr. Katz? Yes. Karen San Hilaire? Yes. Erin Kelly? Yes. Dr. Fisher? Yes. Barbara Lowe? Yes. Sally Hernandez Pinheiro? And Jackie Rowe Adams? Yes. Uh, thank you. Um, let me then, uh, um, I would like to thank the following board members for, for their engagement uh, this month. Sally Hernandez Pinheiro and Jackie Rowe Adams, they visited Lincoln Hospital, and Barbara Lowe and Jackie Rowe Adams participated in the leadership sec session of the Joint Commission Survey for Bellevue. So thank you for so much for for your service. Also, Jackie Rowe Adams is at Woolhall and Jacoby. <laughs> thank you. Thank Had a busy uh, few weeks. Uh, please also be aware that the fiscal year 2023 annual public hearing uh, have been scheduled for each borough, and these meetings will convene at 6 p.m. We have a uh, Brooklyn on uh, June 13th, and it's going to be at Woodhall Hospital. Members of the community are encouraged to register to speak by contacting the board office at 212-788-3360. This information is also posted in our public website. And since we began the process of approving contracts prior to Vendex approvals, there are eight items on today's agenda requiring Vendex approval, of which seven have that approval. There are two items from previous board meetings pending Vendex approval. Since we last met, two, no approval has was received. We will continue to notify the board as outstanding Vendex approvals are received. So let's move on now to the president's report, Dr. Katz. Yes, and uh, because of time, the report is in written form, but I do want to read into the public record an update about our asylum seeker contracting response. We have the following additional contract actions, an expansion and one-year extension of the existing emergency agreement with Huron Consulting Services for project management services, includes overseeing the opening and daily operation of the sites, management of third-party vendors, report of project activities, and escalation of operational issues with a resultant increase in the not-to-exceed amount from $18.5 million to $50,100,000. A new hotel contract with RHC operating LLC as the Roosevelt for a period of three years with a minimum term of 14 months, which can be terminated on 120 days notice with a not to exceed amount over the entire term of $115,195,752. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you so much. So we have several resolutions to consider, so which is going to be the main the main component of the meeting. So let's get started right to it. So number four on your agenda is authorizing New York City Health and Hospitals Corporation, the system to extend its affiliation with State University of New York Health Science Center at Brooklyn, aka down aka Downstate Health Sciences University, for services at NYC Health and Hospitals Kings County and NYC Health and Hospital South Brooklyn Health <clears throat> through June 30th, 2026, for a total not to exceed $62,164,000 $164, 
$598, which includes a 10% contingency. This was presented to the Medical and Professional Affairs Committee on April 8th, 2023. Thank you, Chairman of the Board, President. So our current situation is we have an affiliation agreement between H&H &H and SUNY Downstate, Downstate Health Services University, which is set to expire June 30th, 2024. We've negotiated the terms of a renewal agreement with the term beginning this July 1st, 2023, for three years ending June 30th, 2026. The previous affiliation agreements between SUNY and Downstate combined both the academic affiliation and the clinical affiliation in one agreement. Going forward, we will have a separate agreement for professional services, which we are discussing today, and the academic affiliation will be covered in a separate agreement that will run concurrently. The total cost, as you stated, for the three years is a cost not to exceed $62,164,598, which includes a 10% contingency. Um, we will like to enter into this as a negotiated acquisition since SUNY is especially well positioned to continue what their, the services they're currently providing. There are two hospitals involved in this agreement. One is Kings County Hospital with the specific services being emergency medicine, psychiatry, and radiology, and the other South Brooklyn Health solely for surgery. The number of providers currently on the SUNY contract is a total of 36.2 FTEs at Kings County and at South Brooklyn Health, it's a total of 2.8 FTEs just for the service of surgery. I'm gonna turn this over to Matt Fay to talk to, to speak to the finances. The annual budget uh, that's, uh, that's structured around the SUNY affiliation agreement uh, annually is around $18,283,759 starting in fiscal year 24. Um, that budget increases annually, uh, is expected to increase annually by about 3%, uh, which would generally cover the cost of a cost of living adjustment uh, across, the, uh, across the workforce. Um, this would include both the Kings County providers as well as the South Brooklyn Health providers. It covers the active providers currently in their employ as well as a sessional pool um, to cover additional hours that may be worked. It also funds uh, budget authority for vacant positions that are currently being recruited. As you go to next, the next slide, you'll see the division uh, of the expenses between those two sites, with Kings County being the, the majority. Uh, in fact, I apologize. If you go back to slide seven for one moment, you'll notice that between fiscal year 2023, our current fiscal year, uh, and fiscal year 2024, which is our upcoming fiscal year, uh, there is a decrease of about uh, three and a half to four million dollars in total spend. This is a reflection of the division of the contract between an all-inclusive contract that included um, graduate medical education expenses and this new agreement that only includes the uh, expenses of the physician and provider workforce. The graduate medical education uh, contract is uh, going to run about the three and a half to four million dollars in the separate agreement. That explains the, the reduction in cost between 23 and 24. If you move to slide eight, you see the uh, distribution and the expenses between uh, Kings County and South Brooklyn Health. Uh, again, following the FTE count that Dr. Allen referenced, uh, the majority of the FTEs and therefore the majority of the uh, budget authority uh, is at Kings County uh, with the balance of that at South Brooklyn Health. Uh, this is the three-year value, fiscal year 24 through 26, plus the 10% contingency, bringing the total not to exceed uh, of the previously stated 62 million 164 598 resolution uh, so any any questions on from board members on the resolution so hearing none I would uh, like to ask for a vote thank uh, dr. Katz yes Karen San Hilaire yes Erin Kelly yes dr. William Fisher yes Barbara Lowe yes. Sally Hernandez Pinero, yes. Jackie Rowe Adams, yes. and Jose Paganias. Thank you so much Thank for the you. presentation. Uh, 
wonderful one, Dr. Katz. Yes, uh, please be patient with me as I read the, the next following five resolutions. Uh, amending the resolution adopted at the February 23rd, 2023 by the Board of Directors of the New York City Hospital Corporation regarding the authorization of a subsidiary public benefit corporation to be established to hold a license under Article 43 of the New York Insurance Law by approving the name of the new subsidiary to be Metro Plus Health Trio, Inc., and substituting the name uh, Metro Plus Health Trio Inc. for Metro Plus Health Gold Inc. throughout such resolution. Um, approving Frederick Covino to be a member of the Board of Directors of the Subsidiary Public Benefit Corporation to be established to hold a license under Article 43 of the New York Insurance Law um, as authorized by the Board of Directors of the New York City Health and Hospital Corporation its meeting of February 23rd, 2023, to serve in such capacity for a term through May 25, 2028. Approving Carla Silverman, uh, RNCNMMS, to be a member of the Board of Directors of the Subsidiary Public Benefit Corporation to be established to hold a license under Article 43 of the New York Insurance Law, uh, Article 43 Corporation, as authorized by the Board of Directors of the New York City Health and Hospitals Corporation at its meeting of February 23rd, 2023 to serve in such capacity for a term through May 25, 2028. Approving Salvatore uh, Russo to be a member of the Board of Directors of the Subsidiary Public Benefit Corporation to be established to hold a license under uh, Article 43 of the New York Insurance Law as authorized by the Board of Directors of the New York City Health and Hospital Corporation at its m meeting of February 23rd, 2023 to serve in such capacity for a term through May 25th, 2028, approving uh, Valencia M. Lloyd to be a member of the Board of Directors of the Subsidiary Public Benefit Corporation uh, to be established to hold a license under Article 43 of the New York Insurance Law as authorized by the Board of Directors of the New York City Health and Hospital Corporation at its meeting of February 23rd, 2023 to serve in such capacity for a term through January 28, uh, 2026. I want to clarify that I'm reading the resolution because appointments um, to this board are brought uh, to the board by me as your president. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, Steve Cushman, who's been a phenomenal addition to the Metro Plus staff, well known uh, throughout the city for his uh, good work to New York City. He's going to provide um, the, some background information, uh, but I'm going to uh, take uh, the personal privilege. Sal Russo is here. Sal, where did you sit down? Stand up. Sal has been a tremendous supporter of health and hospitals. 30 years he gave to this organization, um, including as SVP and general counsel, um, and just a tremendous individual who also does in his spare time when he's not a partner at a law firm, a variety of good deeds um, in the community. And Sal, you're a tremendous person and a great support to us. And we're so appreciative that we now have an opportunity to work with you in an official capacity in addition to all the ways you've helped us. I thank, thank you. you and the board for this opportunity to once again serve the NYC Health and Hospitals. Uh, it's a pleasure and you have an outstanding mission which has always been deep in my heart. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Steve. Thank you, and thank you for the kind words for myself as well. Um, so uh, in addition to Sal, uh, Fred Cavino is one of the nominees. He also has uh, 20 years of experience with health and hospitals, culminating as the uh, uh, vice president for finance at the corporate office. Uh, Carla Silverman, who is has a lot of experience on e equity uh, and healthcare, and currently is the associate director for complex care, complex care delivery at the Center for Home Care Strategies, which uh, works nationwide to improve in, uh, innovation and uh, in delivery care systems. Uh, and then the last one was Valencia Lloyd, who is currently on the board of Metro Plus Health. 
She previously was the director of the Division of Managed Care, also known as the Division of Health Plan Contracting and Oversight for the State Department of Health. Uh, we're delighted to have uh, all three of them, and, uh, and Sal, of course, uh, on the board, uh, should you approve them. The last resolution was a new name for the corporation. The last time we were here, we uh, had you approve Metro Plus Health Gold. It turns out, after the Affordable Care Act and the uh, use of gold and platinum and silver uh, to describe plans, the state uh, DFS no longer wants to use those names in corporate names. And so we have chosen a different name, Metro Health Plus uh, Trio, Inc., to reflect the importance of uh, members, uh, providers, and insurance plans, uh, all as important components of achieving good health outcomes. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Any questions on the resolutions? Okay. So let me then take it up for a for a vote. Um, individually, no. correct, Calicia? Okay. Individually. So can we call out the okay. numbers? I will do it. Okay. Number Please. five. <laughs> so um, for resolution number five, the uh, is amending the name. The, the name the, change. The name. Uh, Doctor Katz. Yes. Uh, Karen San Hilaire. Yes. Erin Kelly? Yes. William Fisher? Yes. Barbara Lowe? Yes. Sally Hernandez Pinero? Yes. And Jackie Rowe Adams? On the appointment approving Frederick Covino, um, Dr. Katz? Yes. Karen St. Hilaire? Yes. Erin Kelly? Yes. Dr. William Fisher? Yes. Barbara Lowe? Yes. Sally Hernandez Pinero? Yes. Jackie Rowe Adams? Yes. On approving Carla Silverman, uh, Dr. Katz? Yes. Uh, Karen St. Hilaire? Yes. Erin Kelly? Yes. William Fisher? Yes. Barbara Lowe? Yes. Sally Hernandez Pinero? Yes. And Jackie Rowe Adams? Yes. On approving Salvatore Russo, uh, Dr. Katz? Yes. Karen San Hilaire? Yes. Karen Kelly? Yes. William Fisher? Yes. Barbara Lowe? Yes. Sally Hernandez Pinero? Yes. And Jackie Rowe Adams? Yes. And on approving Valencia Lloyd, Dr. Katz? Yes. Karen San Hilaire? Yes. Karen Kelly? Yes. William Fisher? Yes. Barbara Lowe? Yes. Sally Hernandez Pinero? Yes. And Jackie Rowe Adams? Yes. So, resolution is approved. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Let's move on to number number 10. Um, <clears throat> authorizing the New York City Health and Hospitals Corporation to execute an agreement <clears throat> with Crothall Facilities Management for biomedical program management for an initial term of eight years with two one-year options solely exercisable by the system in an amount not to exceed $504,327,705 for the entire contract term. This was presented to the Medical and Professional Affairs Committee on April 8, 2023. Good afternoon, board chair, uh, Dr. Katz, thank you. Uh, let me just give you a little bit of background uh, and First and foremost, I just wanted to say congratulations to Joe, and uh, Joe will be leaving, retiring from us, but just wanted to say thank you for your service. Thank you. Um, so Health and Hospitals has been using Crothall since 2014 um, as its uh, management of materials of uh, biomedical equipment program. Um, and then uh, we did a... Uh, RFP and an agreement where uh, being managed by the OFC or uh, Office of uh, Contracts and Controls uh, in 2017 and then it merged into supply chain um, and then the agreement and relationship management were transferred to, to supply chain. The original scope of the service was limited to repair and maintenance and it, won't, it was only about 67,000 assets. Um, and then staffing and managements were designed based upon the uh, original scope of the business. Um, as the service uh, gaps arose, the agreement expanded to cover other services such as dialysis, lab equipment, chillers, stretchers, and then uh, uh, correctional health, IT support, warehouse, and transportation. Uh, Crothel Biomed agreement is board approved, not to exceed 260. Uh, 2214605 for the term of the contract, and current agreement expires June 30th, 2023. So just to take a look at the current structure, 
Um, right now we have Crothel, as I said before, the original agreement started in 2014. And then each year uh, for <coughs> nine years going, running, uh, there were different amendments to include different pieces of the business. Uh, we started with 67,000, and now we're up to 126,000 in a nine-year period. On your left-hand side, this is the structure of Crothel uh, at, for the system. And next slide. The market overview uh, for the ID, IDNs uh, provide biomedical equipment management in several ways. The first way is the alternative equipment management uh, maintenance, which is the current model that we are in right now. Uh, then there's the in-house personal biomed equipment technologist, uh, the service contract and original equipment manufacturer and independent service organizations, and then the risk insurance coverage. There's various factors and risks uh, were considered with the in-house and the OME, I mean OEM and risk insurance coverage services, including the financial impact. The clinical equipment maintenance and operations is regulated by uh, the Joint Commission and other regulatory bodies. How the future state is going to look, um, currently right now, how, how we want it to look, is equipment maintenance, which we're currently doing, uh, where warehousing and transporting different equipment, and there's two other entities that we're, we're getting involved with. So there's the biomed IT support and the equipment maintenance for the system. And those are the two entities which we're, we're, we're really ramping up. We want to ramp up. And we're going to use data to drive to the goal. Um, next slide. So this is the scope of the services. Uh, all four, as I just indicated on the last slide. So you have equipment maintenance, you have biomedical EITS support, the storage and transport, and then the equipment maintenance. So each one is different, but it serves the piece of the pie for, for the entity. So the scope for equipment management is income, incoming inspections, PMs, equipment relinquishments, uh, FDA action management and reporting. The ETIS, um, that is to link with EPIC, PACS integration, medical device coordination, IT security review and reporting as well. And then storage speaks for itself, centralized warehousing uh, for emergency equipment, backup equipment, transport to facilities and reporting out that. And then the equipment management is a, a significant piece that we wanted to take a look at because we wanted to take away um, some of that, that responsibility from our nursing, our PCAs, uh, and other staff and really get them to the bedside that they don't have to worry about having equipment and making sure that it's clean, making sure that it's tagged, making sure that uh, it is working. Um, and then obviously the KPIs and the re reporting structures for each four of the services. Next slide. This is how the new, um, the new TO is going to look. Um, it's based on the four elements uh, services that I talked about. It will be, uh, now I just wanted to talk about ETS real quick. Uh, so they will be reporting to Kim Mendez and her staff so for the integration piece uh, for any of the devices that have to link to Epic packs um, for the system. Uh, we will still have, but a little bit more of management on the other side, uh, the facilities leadership, uh, the biomedical engineering and equipment, and then of course the warehouse. This is for the acute care, Gotham, and the LTCs, as well as correctional health. Next slide. The current, current spend, uh, as you can see, uh, it will go down for the clinical engineering for the new spend. The warehouse transport goes up slightly. Avoiding uh, avoidable damage is going to remain the same at one million. Equipment cleaning and management, that is the new piece. Uh, that is spread over uh, annually at $10 million. And then a biomed IT support, which is new, 1.8 or 1.9 million. For a total of uh, 48 million, 23,186 uh, annualized, as opposed to 37. 409-375.
<clears throat> for MWBBE, um, release of the RFP, the vendor diversity team, um, the program for scope of, of work that might be subcontracted. Uh, recruitment was identified as the only uh, scope that would possibly be uh, subcontracted. The estimate value of such the work, uh, however, was too small to uh, set a diversity uh, vendor component percentage, approximately 0.1%. Accordingly, uh, this solicitation was ex uh, excluded from the MWBE program. The prior contract uh, was also excluded from the MWBE program as well. None, nevertheless, uh, the, the vendor diversity team asked the vendor about their MWBE and the CSG efforts. Next slide. So their affiliate is uh, Food Buy, uh, and they do business with about 450 MWBEs. They have a diverse uh, supplier acceleration program that educates, mentors, and develops 10 businesses annually, and currently has a, a utilization of about 4%. Their parent company, Compass Group, uh, they are the first international company of its kind to announce a sweeping commitment to a 2050 net zero emissions uh, economy, validated by the science-based uh, target initiative, or the SBTI and a further commitment to a carbon neutral in our worldwide in their worldwide operations by 2030. Um, there's a, tr a transition of all of their fleet vehicles globally to a 100% plug-in, renewable electrical uh, across all, all of their operations, uh, packaging solutions to further reduce the single-use uh, plastics, and then also the global deforestation free and land uh, conservation free supply chain. So this was the RFP criteria. This was the group that was set up, the evaluation committee. Uh, the minim minimum criteria was 10 years in business, provided similar programs for multi-location multi IDNs with uh, assets of at least 100,000, uh, gross sales of about 75 million annually, Experience in management of represented labor, and then this was the criteria, 35% management plan experience, 25% implementation and transition planning, 25% cost, 15% references. Next slide. And this was the outline of how we went about the procurement. So 10-3-22, the RFP was posted on the city of uh, Records sent directly to eight vendors. 1021 pre um, proposal conference held, eight vendors attended. 108 proposal deadline, three competitive proposals received. Then January 26, 23, the evaluation committee uh, debriefed and the vendor on the uh, vendor's proposals. February 16, 2023, the evaluation committee completed the scoring. Uh, sheets and submitted to the supply chain for tabulation and Crothel Facilities Management Inc. was the highest rated proposer. This was the vendor per, uh, performance and as you can see uh, except for one there was an NA uh, but all the rest were yeses and the performance overall was excellent. And this is the approval request. Thank you so much. Any questions from board members? Please. Yeah. Um, the nature of this work, you almost need a crystal ball. Um, I was just wondering, you know, if, if we have these projections for a period over the course of time, uh, if there's any way you can just speak uh, just briefly about what you plan to do versus what Yes. Maybe reality. Sure. So uh, currently right now, we have our PCAs, our nurses, um, in terms of the equipment, cleaning the equipment, making sure the equipment is working, uh, making sure that uh, working with biomed in terms of uh, the maintenance of the equipment, um, then also making sure that we have 
we do our you our annual uh, servicing on the commit on the equipment not the commitment the equipment as well as making sure that the that the that the equipment that we're currently using are is it at the end of life or is the servicing at the end of life and so uh, we want to take that away from all of our nurses all of the PCAs making sure that they are bedside taking care of the patients uh, and making sure that they have what they need at the time of service. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the familiarity with the equipment uh, uh, will, of course, have to be assured. Yes, and so uh, Crawford will train up those individuals. They, they go through a, a lengthy process of training so they know the particular equipment. Uh, we will probably start that in the ED and then move it forward upstairs to the units. And, and this is for all of the hospitals. It's a concern for on-site people who can uh, assist them. And yeah, actually, they will be on-site, uh, these folks. Okay, yes. good. Right. Sally. Thank you. Uh, Sally and then Jackie. Um, no, it's fine. Barbara covered what I wanted to cover. Oh, okay. So you, first, let me say thank you for your wonderful customer service that you showed us. Oh, you're welcome. Thank, thank you for coming. It. Yes. And so, do you I always ask about timelines? Because yeah. I'm a stickler for time. So, what do you estimate? What are you looking for? Um, so, it's going to start immediately because the contract is up uh, June 30th. So, we want to start this immediately. And so, uh, uh, any idea what you think of completion? Oh, it, it's not complete. It's a journey. Ba basically, we okay. will be using this every day for the term of the contract. Uh, so it's really eight years and then two, uh, that's a two journey. years extension. That's a journey. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. We, but we want to do this uh, fairly quickly, onboard everyone, get them in. Uh, we want to really take it away from nursing and PCAs and really uh, get them, as, as well as you know, we're, we have definitely nurse shortages and we want our nurses to concentrate on the patients. Good. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> Thank you so much. Let me ask for a vote from board members, uh, committee members in this case, actually. Dr. Katz? Yes. Karen St. Hilaire? Yes. Karen Kelly? Yes. William Fisher? Yes. Barbara Lowe? Yes. Sally Hernandez Pinero? Yes. Jackie Rowe Adams? Yes. Jose Pagan, yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so let me move. The biggest committee we've seen yet, Chris. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Let me move then to, to thank you so much. Uh, let me move to number 11 on your agenda, which is authorizing the New York City Health and Hospitals Corporation, the system, to execute an agreement with Sodexo Inc. for laundry processing and linen distribution services for an initial term of five years with one one-year option solely exercisable by the system in an amount not to exceed $145,548,888 for the entire contract term. This was presented to the Finance Committee on April 8, 2023. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Paul Albertson presenting uh, this resolution and request. Uh, and it is a request to enter into a contract for end-to-end -end laundry and linen services for the system. Yeah. Currently, the uh, services are provided through uh, Sodexo. And Sodexo was selected in 2011 as the uh, system partner as an outcome of a RFP when the system closed the Brooklyn Laundry Plant and transitioned to a union labor uh, linen plant. Uh, it was a nine-year contract that uh, ended June 30th, 2020. Uh, and then due to the COVID-19 pandemic, it became impossible to finalize a the on-site operational assessment for vendor walkthroughs needed to conduct a solicitation in 2020, and Sodexo developed a proposal to improve our services with enhanced management and staffing and our end-to-end -end processes, uh, and that was presented uh, through the committee and board process for a two-year agreement with a one-year renewal option, which was improved approved in May of 2020 as a best interest renewal. That ends this uh, June 30th. Uh, the not to exceed on that existing contract is $50,438,922. The expected contract is 
uh, spend is $51,338,922 uh, with the additional expenses related to increased volumes and processing. Uh, there is also an additional expense related to COVID of uh, $8,161,078 authorized by emergency deviations for additional locations uh, and increased infection prevention uh, measures and increased volumes. Uh, in terms of our background here, for the last three years, Sodexo has built on their existing strengths. Uh, they've had a strong uh, detailed contingency plans, provided end-to-end -end, uh, supply and management in all of our patient care areas. We've had a very good um, distribution and linen fill rate and their protocols. They've upgraded uh, the staffing as they had promised with adding two regional directors. Uh, additional leadership in the facilities. Uh, they've also uh, reduced our linen utilization in our emergency departments through implementation of um, uh, vending machines that we manage there, and that's been an annual savings of more than a million dollars. Uh, they've worked with linen committees at our facilities and imp implemented software to help us on needing uh, the daily amounts of linen on patient care units. We have um, the RFP criteria that you see on the next slide about our minimum criteria to engage a vendor with uh, adequate experience to service us with more substantive criteria about their skills and experiences, uh, cost references, and MWBE. We had a robust evaluation committee to include uh, engagement from our facility leadership uh, from our chief operating officers to infection prevention and nursing, uh, post-acute care to assure we uh, touched uh, everyone's engagement on this important service. We had a um, process that we've outlined here for procurement uh, where after we had approval of our RFP process, we posted it on city record uh, in uh, December of last year, we had uh, several conferences and facility walkthroughs uh, in December. We received our responses in January. We had several meetings with our evaluation committee members uh, in February and March. And uh, in April, we completed our process and uh, Sodexo was the selected uh, vendor. And our plan <coughs> going forward is that uh, Sodexo will include a, a cap on linen loss expense uh, despite our year-over-year -year increases in our patient days and emergency department utilization, which has, of course, increased our linen usage. They will enhance the on-site staffing uh, at facilities for longer daily staff access and better linen management. Uh, we're going to continue using our kind of dispensing uh, equipment for the scrubs that we use for all of our staff in the perioperative and um, labor and delivery units, um, that we will be expanding our um, Alex machines, the ones that we've used in the emergency departments at South Brooklyn Health, to trial them for, again, enhancement on management and service for our staff and patients. And there's also a new kind of state-of-the-art software that they'll be implementing that we'll be able to imp uh, integrate with Epic for on-time real uh, census information to help us with our um, appropriate PAR levels for uh, linen on each of our patient care units. We have included our veteran <coughs> performance. Uh, that demonstrates really satisfaction in all of the components uh, that we measure on. Uh, we have our utilization plan from MWBE. Our diversity committee had uh, set a target of 17 percent. Uh, Sodexo has come in with a 24 percent plan. They've also achieved at least 24 percent over the last uh, three years when we uh, began organizing it with them. Uh, so we're very confident that we will again be meeting those uh, goals there. So uh, at this time, I'm requesting to seek approval to award a contract to Sodexo to provide laundry and linen services for the system at a not to exceed amount of 145548000 
$888. A requested contract term is five years with one year renewal option at the discretion of the system with a contract start date of July 1st. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sally. Just a quick question on the numbers. I got a little confused. So the new contract is uh, up to six years for $145 million. Correct. And then uh, as background, you said that the not to exceed uh, figure on the existing contract, which is for a three-year period then right. that we've done it, right, is about $50 million. Correct. And then, um, but the total contract spend, is it for that same three-year period is actually going to be greater because of these two add-ons? The expense uh, is really, it's a six-year agreement, and that it also includes the expanded staffing that the facilities have requested for their sites. So the bulk of that increase really is uh, the staffing and, and also increased um, to some degree in the expense in processing the linen and the greater linen volume that we're using. Uh, okay, so the three-year contract, I, I'm, I'm just confused on your last, on background, your last paragraph. That last paragraph, that does all that speak to the three-year extension? That was correct for uh, the years 20, uh, July 1st, 2020 through June 30th, 2023. Okay. So that ends up being about whatever, 12, 14, 15 million dollars a year, which is roughly the same as yeah. the new contract? 17. No, the new contract is more uh, around 23 million. Around 22. For, for six years. Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, thank you so much. So let me let me ask for a vote then, uh, Dr. Mitchell Katz. Yes. Karen San Hilaire. Yes. Erin Kelly. Yes. Dr. William Fisher. Yes. Barbara Lowe. Yes. Sally Hernandez Pinero. Yes. Jackie Rowe. Yes. Adams. So, Paganias, thank you so much. Paul. Thank you. Uh, let's move on to the next one, which is uh, number 12 on, on your agenda. Authorizing the New York City Health and Hospitals Corporation, the system to execute a five-year contract with Health Resources Optimi Optimization, Inc., Health ROI, for coding denials management services for an amount not to exceed $6,820,680. And this was presented to the Finance Committee on April 8th, 2023. The floor is yours. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Margie Carlin, um, and this is my colleague Lisa Perez from Revenue Cycle Services. We are, uh, we'll start with the resolution authorizing New York City Health and Hospitals Corporation to execute a five year contract with Health Resources Optimization Inc., Health ROI for coding denials management services for an amount not to exceed $6,820,780. So um, currently the system receives an average of 420 cases of DRG denials of full payment with an estimated yearly loss of $22 million. So DRGs are assigned to each inpatient account encounter for reimbursement. DRG denials or DRG downgrade denials are when the payers request a modification to the DRG that we used for billing, which results in a lower payment amount. HROI will be called upon to provide the 11 New York City Health and Hospitals acute care sites with assistance in the following services. Writing the appeals letters for DRG downgrade denials, defense, following up for a decision of outcomes, providing feedback on trends to facilities and identifying steps to reduce those payer denials. Next slide, please. The annual net revenue impact per year is estimated at $6.8 million with a cost of the contract at $1,364. At $1, that equates to $34 million over the course of the five years with the expected cost of $6.8 million. Uh, 
This is, um, I'm sorry, I've, I've lost, my, lost my place with the notes. Um, you could go, to, I just summarized this. Um, you could go to the next slide. So the RFP criteria is listed out here. It was based on cost, experience, and MWBE obligations. The committee consisted of key stakeholders in the process and workflows. So you can see um, HIM directors, revenue integrity, coding, um, people from central office, and the facilities. Next slide, please. The overview of procurement is listed out here. The RFP was posted on the city record in October of 22. There was a pre-proposal conference, a proposal um, deadline. Um, the four vendors were, um, there were only four vendors. They all presented proposals. After the debrief, um, the, the scoring was very close, so the vendors were asked to submit the best and final pricing in February. After the final scoring on the said criteria, HROI was selected. Next slide, please. So um, HROI does have a 30% MWBE utilization plan with the subcontractor, Betts Mitchell Associates. Final slide. We're asking to move forward with a contract cost not to exceed $6,820,780 $6, with a contract of three years with two one-year renewal options. Thank you. For Thank the presentation, you. any any questions from board members? Just a quick. I'm getting confused with numbers today. Uh, <laughs> the um, you assume the vendor is going to be able to recover about thirty percent, and then he's paid on a contingency. That twenty percent figure is twenty percent of what they're able to recover. Exactly. And is that twenty percent customary, or did each vendor come in with a different contingency? Each vendor came in with a little bit of a different contingency, a little bit higher, um, uh, a little bit lower, like uh, one or two percent. But with the service <coughs> being provided, yeah, they it averaged about twenty. Okay, thank you. Okay, I wanted to make one one high level comment. Uh, when we started together five and a half years ago, and we had to close a deficit. The idea was rather than closing things, we were going to build revenue. And people like Margie, Matt, John Olberg, our, our facilities people, are now producing $2 billion a year in extra revenue, and that's what keeps us running. But the reason I wanted to raise it, because I've raised that before, is the vision was very simple. We're going to appropriately bill insurance. We're not interested in billing people. We're interested in appropriately billing insurance. This particular contract just shows how many parts that is, right? This is one tiny part, right, of when a person with a DRG, which is only a subsample, right, that's, if it's DRG, then it's generally Medicare, and this is only if the Medicare DRG is downgraded, right, so, but you can see how the dollars are big, even for this tiny slice, and that two billion dollars represents every part of that process, um, and that, that's what keeps us running. Um, and so these kinds of efforts are incredibly important, and I appreciate Margie and her staff and, and all of the people, are, many of whom are here, who produce the revenue that keeps us running. Well, thank you. We appreciate the opportunity. Any other questions or questions for board members? Any uh, industry trends that may, be, may not have been discussed already? <laughs> We have crystal balls all over the table. Is there more DRG refusals than there used to be, or downgrades? Uh, y yes, okay. they are. They have um, increased um, slightly, but still we have higher months than others. Um, they find new ways, um, and we find new, um, new uh, frontier or, or things we have to go after. But <laughs> Thanks. Let me ask for a vote then, Dr. Katz? Yes. Karen Sandhiller? Yes. Erin Kelly? Yes. Dr. Fisher? Yes. Barbara Lowe? Yes. Sally Hernandez-Piñero? Yes. 
Jackie Rowe Adams, Jose Paganias. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Let me move around to number 17 on your agenda, which is authorizing the New York City Health and Hospitals Corporation to execute a five-year renewal license agreement with Williamsburg Housing Preservation LP for use and occupancy of approximately uh, 1,742 rentable square feet of space located on the first floor at 333 Roebling Street in Brooklyn uh, to operate a pediatric primary care and women's health clinic managed by NYC, NYC Health and Hospitals Gotham Health at an annual occupancy fee of 6347 or $3.64 of rentable square feet, which will increase by 3% per year to reach $4.10 of rentable square feet uh, over the term of, for a total occupancy fee over the five-year term of $33,695, with each party having the right to terminate on 30 days' notice without cost. And this was presented to the Capital Committee on April 8th, 2023. Thank you, Dr. Pagan. All right, so for today, what I wanted to do is talk a little bit about Gotham Health, a little bit about the community in particular where we have our clinic today, and then drill down into uh, how the health characteristics of that community have implications for what we want our clinic to continue to do to support the neighborhood that it's in. So on the slide here, you can see Gotham Health operates 50 locations citywide, 13 of which are in Brooklyn. Including, by the way, the one in red in the middle is our new uh, clinic at 815 Broadway, our Long COVID Center of Excellence clinic. So I'm go to the next slide. I'm going to talk a little bit about what the clinic does today, um, and then I'm going to talk to you about the health characteristics of the community it serves. So uh, today, the clinic, you can see the facade here. This is a clinic that we've invested in over the last five years. Um, we've improved how it looks on the outside and the inside. Um, and it's proudly been um, on the first floor of the NYCHA Williams Plaza housing campus for over 20 years. Last year, in 2022, we saw we had 2,313 patient visits. The clinic itself occupies just over 1,700 square feet. So I'll go to the next slide. So the clinic itself serves a diverse population. Uh, one of the things we wanted to highlight here is that we've seen a, had a growing population of people from the Hasidic Jewish community that have come to this clinic over time. So I'll go to the next slide. So now I want to talk to you a little bit about um, the community health profile um, of this clinic, or um, of the community where this clinic is in, and the particular role that this clinic has served and uh, we'd like to have it uh, continue to serve moving forward in the future. So in terms of, um, uh, first off, um, women's health, prenatal care, you can see here that the uh, dark blue dot shows that uh, the rate of late or, or, or no prenatal care in this community is 2.6%. That's lower, and lower is good for this, than the rate in Brooklyn, 6.2%, or in New York City, 6.7%. And of course, if you have be uh, better, uh, in, in other words, a higher proportion of women receiving prenatal care, your preterm births are also going to be expected to be lower. That's the case in this community as well. The rate of preterm births is 5.4%, which is lower than the rate in Brooklyn, lower than the rate of 8.7% in New York City. So this clinic, we've grown women's health services over time, and you know, the point to take away here is it's working. What we're doing for in women's health in this community is showing that we can have um, improved and good outcomes for this community with respect to uh, preterm births and uh, prenatal care. So this is working well, and we are very excited to continue this. If I want to go to the next slide, something that uh, has more room for improvement is what uh, is in pediatric care. So the rate of childhood obesity um, in this community, Greenpoint and Williamsburg, is higher. 23%. That's 23% of public school children grades K to 8. 23%, almost one in four, have childhood obesity in this community. It's higher than the rate for Brooklyn, higher than the rate for the rest of New York City combined. So here's an opportunity, and this is why we've invested in this clinic and why we want to continue to invest in this clinic. The more kids we see in this clinic, the more opportunities we'll have to address childhood obesity, the more difference we can make. And we can see here there's clear, uh, the data shows us room for improvement with respect to childhood obesity. So we want to continue our pediatric services um, in this clinic and grow and expand them. So if we want to go to the next slide, so just to, to quickly summarize, I've talked to you about Gotham Health, I've talked to you about what we know about uh, the, the health of this community, and I've talked about the unique role that, we, that our clinic has served and we want to continue to serve. That's why we want to bring this, uh, these lease terms to you today. In terms of the, ter in terms of the terms, um, the terms are <laughs> five years, uh, with the base rent of $3.64 per square foot, um, that, of course, is significantly below market rate. Um, the first year, the rent would be $6,347. Over five years, the base rent in total 
would be 33,695. To give you the full picture, adding utilities on top of that. Um, utilities and base rent together, all in, five year period, would, uh, will be $55,164.95. So, our proposal is to um, uh, authorize New York City Health and Hospitals uh, to the terms that I just described. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Any questions on? Any questions? I'll just have a quick comment, which is like, I'm, 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 I like to see when information is presented connected with data, so your evi the evidence base <laughs> <laughs> approach is is well well received I would say. thank you <laughs> so on that note any uh, any other questions or comments okay so I would ask for a vote dr. Katz yes Karen San Hilaire yes Erin uh, Kelly yes dr. Fisher yes uh, Barbara Lowe yes Sally Nandez Pinero real quick question do we have a below market rent because it's a nonprofit or because it wouldn't work if we had a market rate what you know um, for years, we were in these NYCHA sites, and um, we uh, told NYCHA we weren't going to pay anything because the thought was the money just comes out of one city pocket and goes into another city pocket, and, and the idea was we, you know, we shouldn't bother with that. Plus, the sites were in such bad shape that um, it was hard to justify paying for them. Uh, this site. Uh, you notice it's not run by NYCHA, it's right. run by a developer. Mm -hmm. The developer has come in with promises uh, to upgrade the facilities, to make repairs, to improve the entire complex, including our space. And mm -hmm. s they ask that, you know, we kind of meet them in kind and pay this very modest rent. So I don't think that NYCHA or the NYCHA properties rents to for-profit businesses. It's just not part of the picture. So I don't know that they distinguished us from other people, but that was kind of the accommodation to us because of our concurrent missions that they would just charge us this modest amount. Okay, thank you. Uh, yes. Okay, thank you, Sally. Uh, and Jackie Rowe Adams? Yes. So the resolution passes. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. So let me move on to, thank you, Jeremy, to number Stay. 13, <laughs> good, 13, 15th. So let me, bear with me. So authorizing the New York City Health and Hospitals Corporation to sign a five-year license agreement with every table PVC for its use and occupancy of 414 square feet at NYC Health and Hospitals Metropolitan for a retail food operation at an initial rate of $50 per, per square foot or $20,000 per year to increase by 2% per year for a total occupancy fee over the term of $107,723.63. Such agreement to be term, terminable by both parties on 30 days notice without cost. This was presented to the Capital Committee on April 8, 2023. The next one is authorizing the New York City Health and Hospitals Corporation to sign a five-year license agreement with Every Table PVC for its use and occupancy of approximately 1,000 square feet at NYC Health and Hospitals Jacoby for retail food operations at an initial rate of $25 per square foot or $25,000 per year to increase by 2% per year for a total occupancy fee over the term of $130,101 with such agreement to be ter terminable by each party on 30 days without cost. Uh, and number 15 is authorizing the New York City Health and Hospitals Corporation to sign a five-year license agreement with Every Table PBC for its use and occupancy of approximately 381 square feet at NYC Health and Hospitals South Brooklyn Health for a retail food operation at an initial rate of $28 per square foot or $10,666. $10,668 per year to increase by 2% per year for a total occupancy fee over the term of $55,516.70 with such agreement to be term terminable by each party on 30 days notice without cost. And this was presented at the Capital Committee on April 8, 2023. The floor is yours. 
Thank you so much, uh, Matt Siegler, Senior Vice President. I'm filling in for Liara Jontif, who is uh, our indefatigable leader for housing and real estate, but under the weather. So we wish her a speedy recovery. I'm joined by uh, Michelle Figueroa from Metropolitan, Jeremy Berman, who you know, Chris Mastromano, and Jordana Bailey from Jacoby. We're uh, very happy to be here and to present these great food options for our patients, staff, and visitors uh, at three of our facilities. So. Um, Many of our facilities are not near retail corridors. It's not as easy to access food, particularly 24 hours a day, seven days a week, which our patients and staff need. Uh, and we want to be sensitive to uh, their cost consciousness and uh, the need to provide healthy, affordable, culturally sensitive options in all of our facilities. COVID was a major disruptor for the food service operations in many of our facilities. And currently, Metropolitan, South Brooklyn, and Jacoby all need new options for a variety of reasons. Um, next slide. Uh, these uh, three facilities uh, independently were searching for options inside their facilities. When three health and hospitals facilities all come up with the same idea, you know it is a great idea. Um, and they, they each independently um, uh, landed on every table as a, as a great option for them. Um, the main considerations were healthy menu options, culturally sensitive and ethically and culturally appropriate food options in the community around them, uh, price and the taste of the food, and then 24-7 uh, operations. And so we have a little bit down here on how uh, the selection proceeded. Um, it is not of a sufficient size to be an RFP or a system-wide procurement, but uh, the facilities are, are pleased with, um, with every table. So a little bit about every table. Um, they're a public benefit corporation. Um, and they've grown out of a nonprofit organization focused on addressing food related health problems. Um, they currently have eight stores in New York City, uh, and it's organized around a central prep kitchen in Brooklyn um, with uh, guaranteed daily delivery of fresh food. Um, the operations will be 24 7, 365, which is essential. Um, and I think, as you see here, the pricing is you know, quite competitive and uh, affordable for, uh, for our patient staff and visitors, which we are uh, quite pleased about. There, there will be kosher and halal options, um, and every table is a good partner and is pledged to work with us uh, if and when there are specific needs for the communities uh, in, uh, around, these, uh, around these facilities. And so then uh, the next slides go through a little bit of the detail on each facility. Given the uh, size needs, the size uh, the, of the physical space, the number of patients and visitors expected to be served, and the um, average rents in the area. The terms are slightly different, um, but quite quite similar. So I won't go through them in detail, given um, the time pressures folks have. But if there are any questions on the details of each facility, we're happy to answer them. Um, so that is where we are. And we're here uh, with those um, the resolutions that Dr. Pagan uh, read into the record. and. Happy to answer any questions or welcome any feedback or advice. Um, is this um, sort of around the, not around the clock? Is this during? It is. It's 24-7. Okay, good. I didn't hear it. Thank you. Sure. Uh, given the differences in rent per square foot in the different locations, will every table be pricing items the same across the three hospitals? They will be, yes, yes. Wanted to say that Jackie and I volunteered to do taste <laughs> testing. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yes. Can I join you in that. Okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I just want to just add on to, to what Sally is saying, and I just want to commend you and thank you for the great hospitality, and this 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 food piece is very much needed, very much needed. So keep up the good work. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is this is we're voting for the same vendor, so I'm gonna go to bed into one vote. So um, let me then ask for your vote, Dr. Katz. Yes. Karen San Hilaire. Yes. Erin Kelly. Yes. Dr. William Fisher. Yes. Barbara Lowe. Yes. Sally Hernandez Pinero. Yes. And Jackie Rowe Adams. Yes. Se pagan, yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, let me Move on to number 16 in your agenda. More presentations. So, we're doing well. 16. 
authorizing New York City Health and Hospitals to enter into a contract with Nalco Company, LLC, to provide water management services and maintenance services of secondary disinfection systems across the system over a term of three years, with the system holding two one-year renewal options for a base contract amount of $10,395,000, uh, including a 20% contingency of $2,079,000, for a not to exceed amount of $12,474,000. This was presented to the Capital Committee on April 8th, 2023. Good afternoon, board members, uh, Dr. Pagan and Dr. Katz. I'm Manny Saez from the Office of OLFD, uh, accompanied by my colleague, Menji Yendar. Um, a little bit on the background relative to the service agreement. Uh, due in 2015, there was a Legionella outbreak. New York State DOH requires that all acute and post-acute systems and hospitals in New York City have a sampling program for Legionella testing in all of its facilities and institute control measures for le uh, le Legionella exceedance. Um, New York City Health and Hospitals currently has a water management contract with NALCO that expires in June 2023. The total spend over the last five years for water management services and maintenance of secondary systems has been $13,040,417. Next slide, please. Here is the backdrop on our RFP criteria, a minimum criteria of five years, MWB utilization, annual revenue over two million, uh, additional criteria, methodology, experience, and MWBE. Our evaluation committee was made up of all of our operational leaders at each of the sites. Next slide, please. <clears throat> the timeline of our overall procurement concluding with March 21st, 2023, when the scoring was finalized due to the very close scoring of the two vendors, committees met and discussed the two vendor proposals and NALCO was selected through a committee handbook. In our vendor performance, NALCO rated as good and we suspect that when they provide the additional support that we are looking for in the region that they will achieve the excellent status. Uh, most of our facility operators felt that they needed to spread out their coverage, and NALCO is doing uh, just that. Here is the contract budget uh, for fiscal years from 2024 through 2028. Uh, the total uh, contract dollar amount with a 20% contingency is $12,474,000, uh, which um, projects a savings from a previous agreement of $2,645,417. Here is our MWB utilization plan, which was originally gold at 5%. Uh, NALCO is employing the services of AMC services to handle all of our uh, industrial hygiene ice machines. Um, and they are working closely with our diversity team to achieve the MWB status uh, with the state. And they expect to receive that shortly. And if they do not, uh, NALCO has agreed to meet the 5% through other means. And that brings us to our request. Thank you. Any questions? Any, any questions from board members? Um, is that 20% contingency sort of industry standard for this kind of uh, uh, contract? So, so, um, so it's based on the historical spending we've seen for emergency cleanings and emergency disinfections we've had, so we, and, and for addition of new facilities as well. Thank you. Just have you had many findings? I mean, it's an expensive proposition, um, but I'm just wondering how, what the outcomes have been of all this. Uh, I'm very pleased to say that the majority of our program is working in very reasonable levels. We haven't exceeded much in some of our facilities, and when we do, we act quickly to mitigate our water systems in accordance with our water management plans. But we have been consistently under the Legionella, the Legionella levels. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so let me ask for a vote, Dr. Katz? Yes. Karen San Hilaire? Yes. Erin Kelly? Yes. Dr. William Fisher? Yes. Barbara Lowe? Yes. Sally Hernandez Pinero? Yes. Jackie Rowe Adams? Yes. And Jose Pagan, yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, so we have, um, one presentation for 18 through 20, so let me bear with me for a couple of minutes.
Uh, so the first, so the first one, 18, is authorizing New York City Health and Hospitals Corporation the system to further increase the funding by one million nine hundred and sixty thousand two hundred and thirty-eight dollars for his previously executed agreement with Array Architects Inc. for architectural engineering services for the renovation of space at NYC Health and Hospitals Bellevue Hospital and NYC Health and Hospitals Woodhall Hospital in connection with the system's correctional health services initiative to treat its patients who require higher levels of care in its outpost, outposted therapeutic housing units, which follows previously funded increases of $1,814,880 authorized in November, 20, 20, uh, November 2021 and $6,409,289 in November 2022, such that the current funding increase increases from 16,887,169 and 169 dollars and eight to 18 million eight hundred and forty seven four hundred and seven dollars and is to cover design and co design costs at Bellevue only this was presented to the capital committee on 4 8 2023 the next one is authorizing New York City Health and Hospitals Corporation to increase the funding for its agreement with ACOM US USA Inc to provide program management services at NYC Health and Hospitals Bellevue Hospital and NYC Health and Hospitals Woodhall Hospital in connection with the system's correctional health services initiative to treat its patients who require higher levels of care in its out, outposted therapeutic housing units in Bellevue and Woodhall, such, in, and Woodhall, such that the, the uh, funding is increased from $15,136,000 $567 to $16,635,305 to cover program management costs at Bellevue only. And this was presented to the Capital Committee on April 8, 2023. And then number 20, authorizing New York City Health and Hospitals Corporation to increase the funding of its contract with Consigli Construction Company to serve as construction manager builder under a guaranteed maximum price structure for the construction and construction management of the system's correctional health services, outposted therapeutic housing unit initiative at NYC Health and Hospitals Bellevue from the $140,239,695 inclusive of 10% of a 10% contingency approved by the board in May 2022 $159,969,414 by adding $19,629,719 for additional construction and construction management services resulting <coughs> from design changes. And this was, this was also presented to the Capital Committee on April 8, 2023. Thank you, Dr. Pagani. Thank you. Uh, once again, I'm Manny Saez from the Office of Facilities Development, joined by my colleague Oscar Gonzalez, uh, Luis Mendez, uh, Senior Vice President Patsy Yang, and Corey Chung, Senior Assistant Vice President for Correctional Health Services. Oscar for the presentation. Thank you, Manny. Uh, and this is a request to uh, for contract amendments uh, at the Bellevue Outpost Therapeutic Housing Units, also known as OTXHU. Um, uh, just a quick back, uh, quick background and, and, and update. Uh, this is a, this is a, a uh, program that's been implemented on the second floor at Bellevue by the several different vendors, Consigli, Array, and ACOM. We've come to the board several times before, um, and there have been some changes, some regulations, some scope changes, some approvals. Um, so this, this specific uh, request is only for Bellevue for additional amendments that we've had. Uh, uh, we've had new requirements for security operations that resulted in a pause in work and the need to modify existing design and construction scope for the second floor of the recreation area, the visitation areas, the staff support and administration areas, patient spaces, and also some field conditions that we encountered at the site. Increased funding allocation to keep administrative and support staff for modification of existing scope and increases in allocations are still within the total project budget allocated by OMB. So even though this is an increase, we're, we're still re remain within the budget. Potential amendments for future uh, board approvals, there are still some other areas that, we're still, that are still being reviewed. And due to the regulatory agency requirements, there's a potential that we're going to come back again in the future for future board approvals. Uh, the next slide will show you the amendment specifically for Bellevue. Um, the array proposal is one, uh, nearly $2 million. 
um, we already have some of that funding that, that's already been previously approved by OMB, and the remaining balance is with OMB for authorization to proceed, and we should be receiving that proposal, that approval very soon. Uh, ACOM, our program manager, uh, the increase allocation is uh, nearly 1.5 million, and that, those, that funding has already been approved by OMB. And Consigli's increase in funding allocation is 19.6 million, and also a contract uh, extension <coughs> um, uh, to, so that it can expire, so that the new expiration date could be December 31st, 2023. <coughs> uh, 5.5 million of that has already been approved by OMB, and the other uh, portion, the balance, uh, remains with OMB and should be approved very, very soon. All of these components are capitally eligible, so we don't foresee any issues with, with, with the authorization. The next slide shows you the structure of the team. So health and hospitals over and OFB and CHS, uh, Correctional Health Services, oversee the program and the project delivery. We've hired ACOM to oversee the specific um, uh, functionalities and the granularity of the work, of the design of the contractor, uh, excuse me, the design by ARA and the contractor Consigli. Um, so that's how it, we're set up at the, at the particular um, location. Array also has additional design work for the program at Woodhall location, but this, that's not part of this request. Uh, the next slide will show you uh, some of the background and some of the uh, some of the history here. So the OTXHU, Out of Post Therapeutic Housing Units, was publicly announced back in November 26, 2019. Uh, it, and it, we initiated by getting the design consultant and they come on board right away. So we received those initial board approvals back in June of 2020 for their base contract amounts. Uh, then we came back in November 2021 uh, for additional increases and then and, uh, November 22 uh, uh, specifically for Array. Uh, both of those contracts have a five-year um, uh, contract term. So therefore, we're only asking for value increase, not necessarily time increase. Uh, for Consigli, the builder, uh, we uh, entered into a base contract with them in November 2021. Then we locked in the price of $140 million in May of 22, but their contract ended in March 21st, 2023, uh, and we need to extend their contract uh, till the end of this calendar year. The next slide shows you that all vendors have uh, performed very well and they have met the utilization, the WMBE utilization plan. Uh, so we had, for specifically for Array, we had a target of 32%, and they are uh, so far paid up to date 50.64%, um, uh, uh, of the utilization plan. ACOM's target was 34%, and we're up to 36%. And Consigli's utilization plan was 31%, and we are up to 37% on their utilization plan. And the last slide is the official capital committee request. The Office of Physical <coughs> Development and Correctional Health Services is seeking approval for the following contract amendments at Bellevue OTXHU. Uh, first, for array, increase not to exceed by 1,960,238. Increase the total contract not to exceed from 16,887,169 to 18,847,407. For ACOM, increases not to exceed by 1,498,738, increasing the total contract not to exceed from 15,136,567 to 16,635,305 dollars. Uh, Consigli's increase not to exceed by 19,629,719, increasing the total contract not to exceed to 140,339,600 to 159,969,414, and approved contract expiration changed from March 31st, 2023 to December 31st, 2023, and we will take any questions you may have. Thank you. Barbara and then Sally. Okay. Let me just say thank you, Patrick, Dr. Yak. Uh, it is very, very, very important that the nature of uh, this work. Uh, prisons are not humanizing, basically. And I can't wait to see what this is going to look like. This, and the kind of therapeutics that will go on there. I know that um, for a fact that some years ago, I interviewed many people in the community of Bushwick as uh, I was doing some work with the March of Dimes Healthier Babies campaign. And one thing they said about Woodhall that they didn't like was that it was 
open to be a prison hospital, so to speak. So we're going to show them what a human eyes and experience is like. <laughs> That's all I got to say. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Oscar, it, I sound like a broken record on this, but I have to say it every time. <laughs> I, it's outrageous that the state just continues to come back with continuous modifications. They now have stopped work on the project, extended the time for, by nine months, and added $20 million to the project. They look, seem to be looking for some kind of perfection in secure, security at Bellevue. I, I, I have no idea. I'd be interested in seeing, not right now, what additional layers of security they're now requiring, because last time they came in with a pretty ag aggressive enhancement to security and, and changes, yeah. including a Sally port, which I learned. Um, uh, it, it's, and now they've left it open to still come back and request additional changes. It's, um, what is it that's driving? I mean, what is their concern that keeps them coming back? I think, Sally, I, I, I'll, I'll take this on a, on a high level and say, from our point of view, we're frustrated. We would like to open up the therapeutic units 12 months ago. The challenge, I think, in the biggest picture is that they were designed by a prior administration. Mm. And so a prior administration said what they thought was necessary right. in order to run the units. Mm -hmm. um, and that then went through a regulatory approval process, which it got. Right. A new administration has looked at it and said, we don't feel that this is consistent with the regulations on how jails work. Mm. And since the goal is to open them, we don't see any choice other than to try to help them clarify what they need in order to open it and get it through. OMB you know, has been willing to continue to fund the changes. Um, I don't think these are the last changes. Um, but again, these kinds of projects, both it's both sides have to want it to happen in the spot. Um, we, their point of view is that they cannot guarantee security until they feel that the facility is the way they would need it to guarantee security. And I mean, we would, I suppose, have an option of saying, you know, never mind. But we don't want to say never mind because we deeply believe in the mission here. And so we're doing our best to move forward. And I, I don't, you know, I, I, I neither want to sugarcoat it nor have another answer other than we still, we, we wouldn't do this if we didn't believe we were going to get to yes. yes. Yeah. But we acknowledge that it has been a very challenging discussion, and it's probably not done yet. But it does seem we are asymptotically approaching the end. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Maybe we need to put my skirt on. Okay. Any, other, <clears throat> any other questions or comments on this one? So let me ask for a vote, Dr. Katz? Yes. Karen San Hilaire? Yes. Erin Kelly? Yes. Dr. Fisher? Yes. Barbara Lowe? Yes. Sally Hernandez Pinero? Yes. Jackie Rowe Adams? Yes. Sapphire Yes. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, the uh, resolution. So let me then move on to the committee and subsidiary reports. The committee and subsidiary reports were emailed to you and are in your folders for your review and submission into the record. Is there any old or new business to come before this uh, committee? No. And then the committee, uh, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you so much. Thank you. Congratulations. Hey, Great job, Jose.